Welcome to Finance in Five. This is the first budget of a new decade. In the wake of the UK Chancellor's recent pledge to spaz large volumes of cash everywhere to prop up the economy, people now are asking the inescapable question, which is, how on earth are we going to pay for all of this? On today's programme, we look at five taxes that could rise this autumn to cover the coronavirus stimulus spend. Coming up on Finance in Five. In March 2020, Rishi Sunak announced an extensive economic plan to pay for unlimited NHS funding, a strengthened safety net for those falling ill, including statutory sick pay from day one to all of those advised to self-isolate despite showing no coronavirus symptoms. He said that you can contact 111 for a sick note rather than having to visit your GP. Easier access to benefits. Those on ESA can claim benefits from day one, not day eight. Income floor has been completely eliminated for universal credit access to all of those people who've lost their jobs. They can get it more easily. They can also access benefits via phone and online rather than having to go to a job centre. The Chancellor has set aside a £500 million hardship fund for local communities. He's introduced a pledge to pay for 14 days of statutory sick pay to employers. HMRC is going to be scaling up its time to pay service by employing 2,000 staff on phone lines to help people defer their tax payments. Banks are going to be offering loans up to £1.2 million and the government agrees to underwrite the losses of up to 80% of those loans in theory, which should allow banks to lend with confidence. Although, having said that, Lloyds has been refusing to lend despite being supported and bailed out by the taxpayer back in 2008. Businesses with rateable values of under £51,000 have had business rates eliminated altogether this year. Can you get me a rope? What is the point in me mentioning this? Because debt levels are now at record highs, and despite low interest rates and easy borrowing, the Chancellor is eventually going to need to stop borrowing and spending and is likely to find new ways of taxing people in order to rebalance the books. The problem with this is that the government has a consistent pattern of spending above and beyond its means. But rather than acknowledging its own lack of responsibility, or considering that socialism is an utter fraud, it will continue to raid the public purse in a desperate bid to fund unsustainable budgets. People will have less and less. The evidence of history shows that that is when revolution follows. But anyway, that's beyond the scope of this discussion. Here are five taxes that could be set to rise this autumn in order to cover the spending package. One, income tax. There is historical precedent for income taxes to rise. They have been as high as 90% in both America and Great Britain at various times during World War II. A global health crisis and its associated economic shutdowns mixed with untrammeled government spending is sure to provide the needed PR cover that such a tax hike is unavoidable. Businesses would object, especially since many have already suffered losses since February while others have closed altogether. Measures in the US, such as capping pay increases for top executives, have been put forth by the Trump administration. Whether or not the public fall in line depends on how big any mooted tax increase will be. The 50% top rate of income tax under Gordon Brown could be reintroduced, despite evidence that Treasury takings fall under such legislation as top earners with high levels of social mobility redeploy their services offshore within lower tax jurisdictions. When people talk about the collapse of communism in 1989, they believe falsely that the stranglehold of an evil ideology was vanquished forever. In 1989, the reign of communism ended in Poland, Hungary, East Germany, Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria, and Romania. The first free elections were held in 1990 after many decades of one-party rule. But the countries were soon to realize that this was just the start of the battle for democracy. Many Soviet ideas of state control over the individual and centralized government control of institutions are alive and well across the West. While government's primary role is protection of the people, few address the reality that income tax is purely a Marxist concept, requiring the individual to subjugate the privacy of their economic life to the state for review and inspection. People are so used to being slaves, however, that they don't seem to care. The US paid off its national debt completely in 1835 under Andrew Jackson via indirect taxation. 
No income tax was levied until 1913 under Woodrow Wilson when it was capped at 1% on earnings exceeding $3,000 and claimed only to be necessary to support the war effort. It was never rescinded, just like any power the state takes for itself in the midst of a crisis. My own particular view is that income tax will not rise in 2020. The Chancellor probably will keep it at the same level to provide a veneer of respectability to an otherwise stringent autumn budget that will look to recoup its coronavirus spend by surreptitiously imposing a raft of carefully targeted stealth taxes onto the unsuspecting masses. Number two, VAT. This could go up. The rate in the UK at the moment is 20% and it is the individual at the end of the supply chain who has to pay. There's no ability to reclaim this cost unlike businesses which can offset VAT. The VAT regimes of other regions in Europe are shown on this latest 2020 map just here. We can see that compared with other parts of Europe, the UK rate is fairly low, so there is scope for this tax easily to rise. And still the UK government could claim that the rate is lower and more competitive than in many parts of Europe. National insurance for self-employed people. This is a tax that the Chancellor has pretty much made clear that he will increase in the autumn. It is well known that self-employed people who take on more risk in the form of setting up their own business have up until now benefited from paying less in national insurance contributions, meaning that they're left better off than employed persons on the same wage are. The Chancellor will look to eliminate the discrepancy by levelling up, which is politician language for taking more money from the pockets of self-employed people. Number four, pensions. Could rules change in 2022? The income threshold that reduces the amount that high earners can contribute to a pension rose in April 2020 from £110,000 to £200,000. Anyone with an income of under £200,000 will no longer be affected by the controversial tapered annual pension allowance. Currently, those earning above a certain income have the amount that they can save into a pension reduced on a tapering scale. So the annual pension allowance is the maximum amount of pension savings that you can build up in one year. The annual allowance of £40,000 is currently reduced or tapered for those who earn over £110,000 per year. So what that means is that for every two pounds of adjusted income that goes over £150,000, the annual allowance for that year reduces by one pound. The annual allowance will only begin to taper for those who have an income of above £240,000. Our plan for prosperity starts immediately by putting more money in people's pockets. What does that mean? Who can actually benefit from these changes? Well, the changes mainly have been brought in to combat issues within the NHS, which have seen a lot of top doctors cap their working hours because of the loss of pension savings that they could encounter and against the backdrop of providing support to NHS workers facing the coronavirus crisis. It is difficult at this stage to predict whether or not these generous tax giveaways will last. The Chancellor may have spotted another workaround in that he could impose heavy taxes on early pension withdrawals. Many Australians have been tapping their pensions due to COVID-19. It's important to recognise that the pension system isn't paid for. The money hasn't been set aside and added to some wealth fund like in Norway. Instead, it has to come from taxes, and it's so huge it can't possibly last for the next several decades. Even Polly Tyneby of The Guardian acknowledges that the boomer generation has handed today's youngsters an intractable nightmare in the form of unpayable debt and pensions. The whole system is unravelling, but consumed by short-term interests, the politicians are unlikely to do anything to change the current arrangements. This is the right response and at the right time. Instead, they'll keep taxing us rather than looking at the whole system and seeing how it can be reformed. Number five, capital gains tax and death duty. Capital gains tax has to be paid on items which are sold at a substantial profit. Antiques, shares, precious metals and second homes could all be subject to the tax if you make enough money from them. But working out exactly how much tax you need to pay can sometimes be tricky. Capital gains tax only needs to be paid if you make a certain amount of profit from the sale of your possessions in any given tax year. The level of profit you can make tax-free each year is set by the government. You only pay tax on the amount you exceed this figure by. In most cases, your profit equals the amount you sold an item for minus the amount you paid for it. 
The rate of tax you pay depends on how much you've sold and how much income you earn annually. For most items, such as shares, antiques or art, you pay 10% capital gains tax if you pay no tax, or you're a basic rates taxpayer. If you're a higher or additional rate taxpayer, you're charged 20% capital gains tax. The difference comes when the profit you make comes from selling a property which is your second, or more if you're lucky, home. If the amount of profit you make is above the tax-free allowance, capital gains tax is 8% more than on other items. So non or basic tax rate players are charged capital gains tax at 18% and higher and additional rate taxpayers are charged 28%. But what if you sell items for a loss? The good news is that you can offset that against your annual gains, reducing your tax bill. This graphic reveals that many other European countries have higher rates of capital gains tax. Sunak could raise this level and still argue that it sits below that of other European countries and that the UK retains a competitive advantage. Recent measures were passed in the spring 2020 budget to increase the threshold at which 40% tax becomes payable on a deceased relative's estate. It meant that certain institutions, such as amateur sports clubs, would not be required to pay any proportion of assets or businesses bequeathed to them to HMRC. But this quickly could be reversed. Let me know in the comments below, what do you think about all of this? Will taxes rise in the autumn? Which ones? And by how much? At the moment, any attempts to predict with certainty that the economy will return to pre-coronavirus levels of growth and unemployment can immediately be dismissed. These are uncharted territories for the global economy and time will tell if European paper currencies are cancelled and replaced with a digital equivalent, so weakened are central banks. People are dying, supply chains are interrupted, disposable income is evaporating, the consumer base is shrinking and government expenses are higher than ever. So those are my thoughts. As always, if this video was interesting, please like, share, subscribe, follow, check back for more content soon. Let me know what you'd like us to discuss on this channel and whatever it is, I will try my best to do a video on it if that's what you want me to do. Have a wonderful day.